You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in London, who are the sole translators of Steiner's work into English and have also given me permission to do these recordings, please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Reimagining Academic Studies, Science, Philosophy, Education, Social Science, Theology, Theory of Language. Seven lectures and a report given in March of 1922, translated by Judith Wormuth Atkinson, and it is Collected Works, Volume 81. This is Lecture 5, entitled Anthroposophy and Social Science, given in Berlin on March 9, 1922. Most honored participants, in my introductory words today, even more than at the other meetings, I will have to restrict myself to making only a few suggestions. There will be a detailed discussion of our economy in the upcoming lectures, and the main substance of what needs to be said about the social sciences will have to wait until then. We cannot speak of social science if we take only one theory as a starting point. Today, and I mean our immediate present, the present moment, we can speak of social science only if we see it against the background of the desperate situation concerning the economy of the civilized world. I tried to describe part of this desperate situation in my book titled Core Points of the Social Question, also known as Toward Social Renewal, after the end of the catastrophic World War. This work was based on an observation about developments in social science that concerning, excuse me, that considering current conditions should have been apparent to all. Our present economy is deeply intertwined with something very basic for the entire scope of social conditions, what we could call the social question. In our times, most people do not think it possible to separate the discussion of social conditions from the question of our economy. Yet my book aimed at the clarification of this issue. The book aspired to demonstrate that within the social organism, the economy must have its own independent position, a position determined exclusively by economic principles, economic views, and impulses. Seen from such a perspective, my book might seem to display an inner contradiction. I am saying this here in a very straightforward way because a lot depends on understanding this. The book was not supposed to be a theoretical work on social science, however. It was intended to inspire most of all the practitioners, those who work in a practical and direct way in business, production, distribution, and all areas of economic life. The book was written out of an understanding that came from observing the economy of Europe for decades. Since the book was intended to be thoroughly realistic, and to prompt practical activity, it also had to contain a contradiction. This is nothing but the same contradiction characteristic of our entire society. I am talking about the fact that the chaotic, messy elements of our social life could actually be productive, but only if each element develops naturally under its own conditions and in its own particular section of society. In my book, I discussed the threefold formation of the social organism, a formation that would lead to a completely independent organization of the economy, almost completely separate from the government, the law, and the spiritual life. The economy would be determined by those who are part of it and by the way they deal with their own impulses. However, we live at a time when this is not yet the case the economy is still interwoven, too enmeshed with these other elements in the structure of the social organism. We live at a time when the contradiction is reality. This is why my study 
which was written on the basis of reality and was intended to make suggestions for this same reality, implied some contradiction. Nevertheless, the study had to be aimed, first of all, at achieving some clarity, at the clarification of the circumstances. And so, making this introduction today, I am in a peculiar position, because people in the widest possible circles generally misunderstood the conclusions I made. My conclusions were based on anthroposophic methods of thinking, as well as on decades of realistic observation of the conditions in the European economy. I can only say that I see very well why my original intentions were misunderstood. Misunderstandings themselves are a phenomenon of our time. Nevertheless, I am convinced that overcoming these misunderstandings is what we should aim to achieve in the field of sociology and in society. I would like to make some suggestions precisely in this respect because they could give us some direction. My book was first published just after the Treaty of Versailles, immediately following the terrible war catastrophe. Those were times when the currency relationships between Central and Eastern Europe were still very different. The impulses expressed in my book back then did not come, quote, out of nowhere, close quote. They were based on the situation in the world at the time, which led me to believe that perhaps there were other people who saw the same things I saw and were seeking change. If so, then it would have been possible, starting with Central Europe, to spread an economic impulse that could have brought certain progress in the midst of the clearly deteriorating economy and social life in general, which still has not recovered. Considering the complicated situation in the world, one would have thought that there would be no arguments against acceptance of the ideas in the book. These ideas were founded in the reality of the time. Nevertheless, they could be attacked. Perhaps they could have been formulated in a different way when they were first written down. But the point was not to create impractical, utopian ideas or to paint a picture of a future social organism. Rather, the point was to find people who understood that we were confronted with real immediate problems in our daily lives, that we had to deal with those problems as best our professional knowledge allowed us, and while dealing concretely with the problems, try to find increasingly better understanding. Generally, however, what happened was something very different. On one hand, there were economic theorists who endlessly discussed what was written in my book and who attached all sorts of, in quotes, demands to the things I had said. There were also theorists who misunderstood what I had said in a very idealistic way and who kept asking how this or that could happen. There are no instant answers to such questions. Only the passage of time reveals the answers. In addition, there was also something that really surprised me. The practitioners of economics, that is the hands-on business people, the entrepreneurs, those who had direct experience in specific areas of economic activity and who knew what works in their area of business and what does not, precisely those people paid no attention to their own knowledge and experience. They allowed themselves to be influenced by theorists who had no direct experience with their particular branch of the economy. When the practitioners discussed the core points of the social questions, their conclusions showed that they themselves had become the most abstract theoreticians. It became obvious that they could be conventional business people in the old sense easily enough, but they did not understand the new circumstances. These practitioners were absolutely unable to discuss the economic problems that I am talking about from any other perspective than the one of abstract theory. It could cause real despair to stand in front of business people trying to have a discussion with them. Some were absolutely not able to look at anything concretely, but instead kept repeating only the most trivial and general points of economic theory. 
along with the repetition of theory originally, those who were very thorough practitioners refused to talk about the possibility of looking at the economic problems in the new way that I suggested in the book. I encountered yet another problem with socialists. Despite the vague interest that my book aroused among them, they did not want to look at their goals from this perspective. They made judgments about everything on the basis of whether or not it fit the old socialist party clichés. This is how we came to the terrible currency disaster that prompted me to make those remarks. It should now be understood and evaluated in a way different from the way we now understand it. When I first published my title Appeal to the German People and Culture and then title Toward Social Renewal, readers aside, those are both available on the website as recordings and the readers aside, there were people who had very serious intentions regarding the process of healing the Central European economy. They said, quote, yes, uh, such suggestions, they called my theories suggestions, uh, are very good, but we have to figure out, first of all, how to improve the state of the currency, close quote. This was said at a time when the miserable situation of the currency was still a paradise compared to the present circumstances. Such statements demonstrate that all we want is to play around with the external symptoms there is very little understanding that the current situation is a superficial symptom manifesting unhealthy economic conditions and that such a treatment of symptoms does not even begin to touch the real evil. These statements also show that there is little understanding of the need to go deeper into analysis of the present socio-economic conditions. If we want to discuss the problems mentioned in Toward Social Renewal, in any realistic way. This is how I came to my appeal, which I expressed at the end of that book and at the end of many lectures. We must come to our senses before it is too late. To a certain degree, it is already too late, since we are no longer able to approach the issue in the original spirit of toward social renewal. Meanwhile, the chaos in our economic life has grown so much more complex that we need many more additional explanations of what, in my view, not only should be stated, but also must be stated. If we want to discuss what damages our economy, we will not be able to avoid examining a general characteristic of our time. When I looked at a newspaper yesterday, I noticed an article here we can see the most important symptoms in simple sentences formulated by some of our contemporaries. Quote, postponing of Lloyd George's resignation until the end of the conference in Genoa. Close quote. This title expresses the entire situation of our time. The main characteristic of our time is to wait. We want to wait. This is the common principle today, to wait until something happens. We cannot say what will happen, but we want to wait until it happens. This attitude has penetrated our souls, and one can see it in all possible areas. Now, I would like to mention something that is apparently abstract, but only apparently. It is actually realistic, because it points out the forces that are active among us, which gradually, through the centuries, have given credibility to this optimistic principle called we want to wait. Looking back at the development of past cultures, we see that ancient scientific thinking should not be called simply scientific. You have heard me call, talk about this in the lecture I gave recently in the, at the Philharmonic Hall. If we look at the thinking that was there, we realize that economic circumstances did not grow immediately out of ancient scientific thought. Originally, economic life developed almost instinctively because of trade, more or less independently of human thought. What people did in their economy was born naturally from their daily life. People acted intuitively. Some areas of trade were certainly expanded, but everything happened more or less intuitively. We might raise some objections against the economic 
conditions of the ancient times, on the basis of modern views of freedom, dignity, and so forth. Nevertheless, it could be helpful to see some remarkable signs of humanity's development, which could teach us a lot even today. To give only one example, I will point out the relationships between employer and employee, if I may use these modern terms with regard to ancient times, in ancient Greece, Egypt, and Asia. Considering how we feel today, these relationships may raise harsh criticism, but any such criticism would be unhistorical. We have to admit that the labor relationships in each particular period of time were based on the sensibility of the people who lived at the time. This is the first thing that we should keep in mind. The other thing that we should keep in mind is the drastic changes in humanity's development that we observe in the 15th century and which affected the entire state of the soul of people in the civilized world. I have emphasized frequently that external history does not tell us much about how the human soul changed its view of life at the time. So, if we ask ourselves how this part of human development relates to the economy, the answer is the intuitive control of the economy of the sort I just described expanded until the 15th century, an epoch of drastic changes. Along with those changes, the state of the human soul was affected by intellectualism, by the desire to understand the world through reason and logic alone. This desire, which became a profound necessity of the human soul, affirmed itself brilliantly in natural science. Technology developed gloriously out of natural science and celebrated an extraordinary triumph which cannot be appreciated enough. Yet, this intellectualism has proven to be completely unable to aid us in understanding the social context of development in human life and human beings themselves. Many debates have demonstrated this, including those during this course. Through such intellectual orientation of the soul, we have discovered the laws of the outer nature of the senses. However, intellectualism will not help us comprehend the complex circumstances of social life that penetrate and are entangled with each other and organize themselves as they become entangled and materialize as they become organized. The system of intellectual ideas is too loose for the phenomena of social life. From intellectualism, Humanity certainly learned how to think scientifically. This kind of thinking covers every subject area, even theology. If we observe it carefully and experiment with it, we will see that intellectualism rules over our entire scientific way of thinking. We consider everything that is not based on intellectualism as simply unscientific. The time of intellectualism overlapped with the transition from a purely instinctive economy to an economy that had to be brought to life by human thought. Thus we could say that at the time when people did not think intellectually about the world, economic life was led in an instinctive way. Along with the trend toward a world economy and world trade, people began to think of their economic life in an exclusively intellectual way. One can see two sides or polarities in economic theory as it developed, in mercantilism and in physiocratism, in Adam Smith's ideas of national economy and in the entire development of political economy up to Karl Marx. On the one hand, economic life itself required that economic decisions should no longer be made intuitively, but that they should rather be based on reason instead. On the other hand, since thoughts could be based only on intellectualism, economic decisions become more and more one-sided. As a consequence, there is nothing that came out of economic theory that we could see as applicable in economic practice. On the one hand, we had the theorists of political economy, such as Ricardo, Adam Smith, and John Stuart Mill, who produced axioms out of intellectualistic postulates. 
On the basis of these axioms, they built confusing, self-contained systems that were like vicious circles. On the other hand, at the same time, we had economic practice, which might have required a symbiosis with the spiritual, but never found access to it. Economic practice continued to develop, however, within the old, almost instinctive life, and thus fell into absolute chaos. These two movements became more and more commonplace in modern times. On the other hand, there were the political economists who had no influence on economic practice. On the other hand, there were the practitioners who continued the traditional practices which threw the economies of the civilized world into chaos. We certainly need to articulate things like this in a very radical way to point out what reality is, what does work, and what should be seen as the real problem. If we are looking now for some connection, for a synthesis between economic thought, which, however, has been meanwhile completely destroyed by the practice, and the practice itself, we can find this connection in only one area. Most recently, a kind of scientific economic realism has developed, which acknowledges that we can never come to a general to to general economic laws that will always apply. Instead, we should take into consideration economic circumstances as they develop in particular nations or among specific groups of people. We can find guidelines with regard to trade only if we look at the specifics of external and concrete economic circumstances as they happen. This is the foundation of what appeared as so-called social or economic legislation. We began to believe that we can analyze the factual economic circumstances in connection with the social conditions that bring them about and then legislate economic guidelines. In other words, we have tried to bring about through the government some of the things we observe in a rather roundabout way. But, excuse me, by doing so, however, we have in fact admitted that real economic laws cannot come out of such observations. Yes, basically this is the situation in which we still find ourselves today. We can see how we are stuck in this situation precisely now when we are able to have ground-breaking experiences, or shall I say, when we are able to evaluate social phenomena in the right way. You all know that Woodrow Wilson came up with his so-called 14 points, exactly at a time when our society fell into such terrible chaos. What were these 14 points really about? Basically, they were nothing but the abstract principles of a man who knew little of the real world, a fact demonstrated at Versailles where he could have actually played an excellent role. A man who was estranged from reality and inspired by intellectualism wanted to show the world how to organize itself. I can only wish that we had been welcomed with such enthusiasm as civilized humanity welcomed those 14 points. However, a large part of the Central European population fell for Wilson's theory even though only for a little while, and made us the exception. In 1917, there were people in Central Europe who were interested in these issues and who asked to speak to me. I did not pursue these people. They either came to me or were brought to me. I tried to show that the latest social developments were abstract and estranged from reality. I tried to show that everything negative, which we considered to be based on bad educational principles, but that we nevertheless see predominating everywhere, could be summarized in the person of this teacher of the world, Woodrow Wilson. I also showed how people welcomed with enthusiasm the abstract principles of this, in the pejorative sense, world teacher. In addition, I tried to show that a recovery from the current circumstances could be achieved only if, in contrast to all these abstract views, we stand firmly on the ground, on a ground that does not exclude thought, but that nurtures the kind of thought grown out of reality. In this case, we would not create any utopia, 
and I would like to say that Woodrow Wilson's principles were pure utopia, utopia multiplied by three. In contrast, we should understand clearly that actual impulses are to be found only in the real circumstances of contemporary humanity. Thus, in all my arguments, I was avoiding any utopian theory. I avoided even mentioning how capital and labor are formed. I gave only a few examples of how we could possibly imagine their developing from the current circumstances into the near future. I have said all this, however, only to illustrate what capital and labor should be. In fact, capital, capacities, could change either in the way I mentioned in my book Toward Social Renewal or in some other modified way. I did not mean to paint some abstract picture of the future. My goal was to explain what the basis for a real solution of the so-called social question could be, not to propose an abstract theoretical solution. I did not intend to, quote, define a solution, close quote, in general for the social question, because I have enough experience to know that it is impossible to do that. In the 1880s, in cozy Vienna, I used to spend at least an hour nearly every afternoon with all sorts of bright people. Within this hour every afternoon the social question was solved several times. Those who see the present without bias can realize that the current solutions published frequently on the pages of thick volumes are not much better than the solutions negotiated with a few strokes of the pen and the many fanatical words spoken over café tables back then in Vienna. Defining a solution was certainly not my goal, and to accuse me of such an intention was a most terrible misunderstanding. All I wanted to show was that the solution to the social question could come about only in a natural way, that it could not be the result of discussions, but only of action. However, the conditions for such action must first be prepared. In my toward social renewal and in other debates, I was referring to precisely these conditions. I was trying to demonstrate that in our social organism we need institutions that would allow the natural development of spiritual life, a development affected only by the conditions and requirements of spiritual life itself. I argued further that we will need a second entity where only the judicial impulses of the governments would be at work, and then a third entity dealing with the economic impulses based on the production and consumption of goods. If this economic entity were to develop out of an associative economic system, it would culminate, in my view, in a healthy pricing policy. By developing an associative economic system, we would not revive the old class system. This is not about dividing people into teacher, class, soldier, class, and worker class. The human being of modern times has progressed to the status of an individual and cannot be placed into any particular class in a theoretical way. However, simply because of the forces of historical development, the existing institutions tend not to treat the spiritual life, the judicial life of the state, and the economy separately from each other, each on the basis of their own conditions. Only after we create the conditions that would fo allow the economist, for example, to make changes in the current market or capital relationships on the basis of purely economic impulses, only then, when such possibilities are created, would we be able to develop what we could call a real solution of the social question. This solution, however, would be in a constant state of becoming. So, my goal is not to solve social problems, because such a solution, in my view, can never be final at any given moment. Once the social problem has appeared, it remains in constant flux. The social organism is like someone who is young and will age. The social organism must be constantly instilled with new impulses, and we will never be able to define it in a fixed form. The government can have a real democratic foundation only if it has a healthy organism in which people consider the individual conditions of each specific area of life in its own right. <laughs>
This will not be accomplished by those who sit in parliaments, mixing all possible interests, where those interested in the economy make decisions about spiritual issues, or those representing the state make decisions about the economy, and so forth. What needs to be said in a healthy organism will not be said by only one person in such a mixed parliament. Rather, it will result from constant and continuous negotiations between the different parts of the social organism. In that sense, my book was a warning that we need to stop the futile discussion of the social question. Instead, we have to stand firm on the ground and deal with social problems on a daily basis. My book was an appeal to those who understand that need to turn abstract theory into thoughtful and real action. Economic associations should be responsible for these actions in the economic area. Such associations are profoundly different from the processes of nationalization that occurred in recent times, and they could be established at any moment on the basis of existing economic conditions. Such associations should consist of the practitioners, the people who are really connected by the processes of production, circulation, and consumption of goods things that really connect all people. These are the people who should organize themselves in associations to establish a healthy pricing policy. In the present situation, we are a long way from benefiting from the practical and professional experience that the people organized in these associations would bring to a healthy pricing policy. Such a policy would not be the result of legislation and discussion, but of experience. Nevertheless, people felt the need to discuss the main ideas that I presented in my book and which I presented in my introductory words to you today. The world was so well trained in abstract thinking that it saw my suggestions only from the perspective of abstract thought. As a consequence, things are discussed for hours that I mentioned only as examples. And the point is missed to tackle the formation of the social organism on a daily basis in the way proposed in Toward Social Renewal. The point is not to search for theoretical solutions to the social question, but to determine under what conditions people will be living in society. Social life will exist when the social organism is working in the interest of all its three parts in the same way that the natural organism works precisely toward unity, though it is also divided into three parts, relatively speaking. Nowadays we have to explain what we mean when we say such things, you see. Even when we have expressed them, there is still an expectation that the words we must use will be taken according to the theoretical meaning attached to them. People immediately translate into intellectualism ideas that obviously are not the product of intellectualism. For example, in my book I speak about capital and about the basic principles of the production process and about labor in such a way that the ideas can be related to life. If we begin abstract discussions, we spend a lot of time on definitions. One would say rightfully that capital is crystallized or accumulated labor while another, would, one would say, also rightfully, that capital is saved labor. We could do this with any concept of political economy if we want to remain within the mind frame of intellectualism. These, however, are not concepts that we can deal with in theory only. On the contrary, we should try to understand how concepts are being formed and how they live. The practitioners who cling to traditional practice while talking abstract theories, could instead do something new. I would like to clarify this through a comparison. Ernst Müller is short and has clearly youthful features and childlike qualities. I see this man 20 years later and I say, quote, this is not Ernst Müller, close quote. Although he is still short and has childlike qualities, the face is completely different. If 20 years ago I have created an image of Ernst Müller, and I want it to be identical with the real person I am facing now, I will be making a terrible mistake. No matter how much people are opposed to believing it, this is exactly what they are doing when they think about the economy. They think about capital and labor 
and they create their respective fixed concepts in the belief that these concepts will always be valid. In this case, however, we do not need to wait for 20 years. We could simply go from one employer to another, from one country to another, to discover that the concept we have created in one place has no validity in the other, unless it has been transformed of its own accord, like the person Ernst Müller. We will never be able to recognize what we are looking at unless we have flexible concepts that are fully rooted in life itself. In our time of scarcity, anthroposophic principles make it possible for economic institutions to find their own expression because anthroposophy by its nature deals with the ever-changing spirit using ever-changing ideas. We can learn from anthroposophy how to infuse our ideas with the force of growth, with an inner flexibility, and how to use such ideas regardless of the disbelief of today's practitioners. We can use flexible thinking in the reality of the social life between individuals, between countries, and throughout the entire world economy, which has now become necessary, although it has been destroyed in such an artificial way. Thus we could say that the attempt to come not to social ideas but to social impulses by means of anthroposophy was not based on anything external. I remember the times when these terms were much discussed. I always had to repeat, social impulse. This made people terribly angry. According to them, I should have used the phrase social ideas or social thought because people had in mind only thoughts. It was terribly upsetting to speak of impulses. They did not realize that I needed the word impulse because I was working with the reality and not with abstractions. Consequently, today we have to establish new conceptions of the so-called social problem. Circumstances are now very different from those in 1919. Things are changing very fast, especially in the area of economics. It is necessary to keep seeing movement, even in those ideas that were already considered to be flexible in 1919, and also to preserve the perspective of common sense. Those who are able to see the reality of economic conditions know that these conditions have changed significantly since I wrote toward social renewal, and that we cannot simply deduce the same conclusions we did back then. Nevertheless, They will find in that book at least an attempt to search for methods of social thinking in a realistic way. That attempt was founded on the constant search for reality, to prevent us from falling into the trap of illusions and mysticism. That attempt was nourished by the quest for exact truthfulness, which is characteristic of the anthroposophic view of the world. The end of Lecture 5